Um, so today, as we get into this word, we're continuing in the book of Romans, this series called Unashamed, a journey through the book of Romans. And if you will, turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. I'm going to read verse 2, but we're going to end up reading a lot of the chapter um, when it comes to uh, this book. This book right here, chapter 12 to the end of the, of the, of the book of Romans, is more of the practical application of what we have been discovering all through from chapter 1. You know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I am justified. I am sanctified. Um, I'm made holy. Uh, just all these qualities that we have because of our salvation, because of accepting Jesus Christ in our heart. You know, this word of God is a legal document. It supersedes any other legal document ever known to mankind. Amen? And uh, because it has, like Paul says in Romans 1.16, it has power to save. Amen? It has power to save, to change a life. And so today's title is called, I Am Being Transformed. I Am Being Transformed. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am being transformed. Now turn to your second choice neighbor and tell them the same thing. I am being transformed. In other words, don't give up on me yet. Uh, I'm, in, I'm, I'm in the transformation process. Some of you might look like a big larvae just sitting there on the table, you know. Others might be in a cocoon hidden away. Uh, for a season where God is just working on you and others you may be right now just spreading your wings and enjoying the fullness of, of, of ministry and what God is doing in your life. And so there is a transformation process going on. But we have to, as we look at this, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is God's will for my life? Have you ever woke up any given day and said, God, what is your will? God, what is your plan? God, what is your purpose? Why am I here? You've heard me say this, that the two most important days of your life, number one is the day you were born, which God knew about it in the, in the annals of eternity past. He already knew you. He had a name for you, a plan for you, a purpose for you. And then secondly, the second most important day is the day you discover why. In other words, when there's that aha moment Having given your heart to Jesus, God begins to reveal the why. Why am I here? What is my purpose? What is your plan for my life? And so there's three primary, um, three primary points we're going to make today. Number one, the, when it comes to fulfilling God's will or discovering God's will, it starts with being transformed. Being transformed into what? Into the image of Jesus. Point number one. I'm just giving you an overview right now. Point number two, finding your function in God's plan, in God's work, in the body of Christ. Find your function. And then thirdly, fulfilling your function in holiness. In other words, the manner in which we go about it. How many of you know that God cares about how we, it's not just the doing of it, but how we go about it? Have you ever been in that mode where you're just like, you know what, I'm just going to get it done. You know, and you don't care how you get it done. You can get it done with a nasty attitude, throwing hammers, breaking dishes, but I'm going to get the job done. Or God says, I have a plan. I have a way that's just as significant. It's not just, you know, it's not just getting to heaven, but it's how we get to heaven. It's the journey we take because it will determine our ability in Jesus, whether we take others with us or not. Because we're either one of two kind of witnesses. You're, you're a witness whether you like it or not. You're either a good one or you're a bad one. And we want to be a good witness. Amen? We want to we we walk in God's favor, God's blessings. And so the first step to knowing God's will, number one is be transformed into the image of Jesus. And so I want you to follow through with me as we go down through this 12th chapter um, the 13th chapter gets into even how we relate to our civil authorities, and it goes on even more about um, other, you know, how we relate to each other and, and the world itself. 
But point number one is be transformed into the image of Christ. Paul says it this way. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, <clears throat> excuse me, by the mercies of God, pardon me, I am on the good end of this bad croup for the last month, and I'm feeling a lot better, but it doesn't sound good yet, so sorry. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Right here in these first two verses, <clears throat> excuse me, right here in these first two verses, we see kind of a synopsis or a, a summary of the process of sanctification. We talked about justification early on. Justification literally means it's the moment you accept Jesus in your heart, the Bible says that you are made just or you're justified. It literally means just as if I had never sinned. Do you realize that when God looks at you, that moment after you confess his son, you confess him as Lord, you confess him as the resurrected Savior, do you realize that literally God chooses to forget everything up to that moment? that all of that has been wiped away, all of that is clean, you know? To the, one who's done, to the one who's done time, what that means is your rap sheet has been expunged. Amen? You're, you, you no longer, there's no longer a database holding any information about your past. No one can come to you and say, well, you know, I went to Google and I Googled you and they said you've done this and you've done this. Well, in God's eyes, he doesn't even see that. It is gone. And so it's just as though I had never sinned. And then sanctification is that process by which we begin to experience our salvation. We begin, it be, we be, you know, as we walk in it, we begin to realize how, that we realize the fact that we are forgiven. We realize what it means to be free. For who the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen? Amen? free indeed. <clears throat> and so it's a matter of us, and that's the, and that's the crux of, of the whole word of God is that the crux of it is, will we accept God at his word? Will we say, yes, God, I believe? Because whether you believe it or not, it remains the same. Uh, his word remains the same. It, not one jot, not one cross T or dotted I will pass away before all of it's fulfilled in your life and in my life and in eternity. And so Paul says here, when it comes to being this transformation, it begins with us presenting ourselves to God. He says, present your bodies a dead sacrifice. No? So we no longer offer up animals as sacrifices, innocent, and can I say dumb animals as sacrifices, but rather he's saying, I want you to offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, that you present it heart, soul, mind, body, spirit. This is our intelligent, reasonable, logical service of worship. When we approach God, you know, we Pentecostals, we love to feel the presence of God. We love the tinglies. We love the, the shabbas. We love the, we love the emotion that comes with worship. We love the presence of God. And, and that is like what Moses said, that is what sets us apart from the world. Amen. To, 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 to sense God's presence is to know God's presence is himself. He's here in the house. He's here in your life. And so in that, he says, don't turn your brain off. Don't turn your intellect off. Don't turn your common sense off. He says, but rather, I want you to present your whole bodies. Because love is not a feeling, it's a choice. It's a choice. When you wake up every morning and you say to your spouse, I love you, it's a choice. Yes, emotions are there. Emotions will follow. 
They'll be there on the heels of a declaration or a, a, a statement. But how, how, what if we approached our spouse like we approach God sometimes? Well, God, I, I don't feel in love. I don't feel like I love you today. I, do you love me today, Lord? I don't feel it, you know? But rather, we approach God in faith and we say, God, whether I feel it or not, I love you. See, God did not make us as robots. He didn't just make us like we just automatically regurgitate. He says, I love you, Terry, and I just say, I love you, God. No, it is a choice. It, it, is, it is a, a desire of mine as a believer to love God, to reciprocate what he has done for me. Amen? We could never repay. We could never even match the sacrifice and the love he gives for us. But he, you know, Jesus, when he came down the cross, he did it at the risk that we would reject him. He did it at the risk that we might not love him back. But the Bible says, even then, while we were still sinners, Christ loved us so much that he died for us and gave his life for us. That's what love is all about. That's true love. Like the word says, there is no greater love than one who will lay his life down for another. And so he says to us, he says, offer your bodies, present your bodies. In other words, not just, not just our lip service, but he says, I want all of you, present them as a living sacrifice. You may say, Lord, I'm willing to die for you, but can we say, Lord, I'm willing to live for you? I'm willing to live for you out in the public, out in the eye of my coworkers and my neighbors. Am I willing to uh, put you on display? And so this includes our intellect. No one can be scripturally intelligent without being spiritually intelligent, per se. In other words, I know people who can quote this thing left and right. I've been on the streets with people, and I've been to quote them a verse, and they chime right in with me. All the while, they do not know God. Just because you know the book doesn't mean you know God. But when you know God, you can know his book. You can know his word. Amen? And so he wants all of us, Romans 8.29, just the chapter that, we, that Pastor Alex gave us last week. By the way, pray for him. He's sick today. That's why you don't see him on the stage. He's in his room, and uh, we need to be praying and maybe helping him out today. And so Romans 8.29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In other words, the moment you said yes to Jesus, God says, you're going to look like my boy, Jesus. I'm going to make you, I'm going to transform you. You ask God, God, what is your will? And God says, I want you to look like Jesus. I want you to talk like Jesus. I want you to, I want you to love like Jesus. The first step to discovering and doing and knowing God's will is to allow him to conform us or to, trans, I should say, transform us into the knowledge of Jesus. Amen. It says, don't be conformed to this world. And of course, it gets into the intellect, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove or test or discern what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you realize what that, that word conform in this context means this? It's like, it's like Christmas time and you pull out all those cookie cut shape, you know, those cookie molds Christmas trees and reindeers and snowmen and snowflakes and, and you start pressing them into a mold. Do you realize what God is saying here is that the world is trying to press you into a mold of which does not reflect the transformation that's going on on the inside. In other words, there's this transformation that's happening. I walked by this dear brother this morning I don't want to call you by your old name because that's your past, but as I walked by him and shook his hand, there is a transformation taking place. He walked in last Sunday halfway through the first service, stayed to the second, raised his hand, came forward. I don't even recognize him this morning. He doesn't look like the same man. Why? Because he's, being, he's experiencing a transformation. While the world and maybe even some of his old friends came by this week and says and called him by his old name and referred to his past, yet it does no longer reflect the work that's going on on the inside. Amen? And to, to none of us as well. 
in the, in the world, in the, he says, don't be conformed because it does not reflect what's happening inside of us, the transformation. And so because we have been born from above, get this, because we've been born from above, we, have not, we do not have the right, tell your neighbor, you don't have the right. Because we were born from above, we do not have the right to continue conforming to the pattern of this world. You don't have the right. Tell your neighbor, you do not have the right. It's just like the dead man we, had, we saw in chapter 4, where the old man passed away. Everything becomes new. He is in the coffin. It has been nailed shut. He is dead. You can you can walk up and pinch him, and he won't get offended. You can walk up and 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 uh, say, you know what? You don't look good to. He don't care. Why? Because he's dead. He's in the grave. The old person has passed away. Everything has become new. We, as the people of God, should be the most unoffendable people on planet Earth, and yet we find ourselves so offended. We, you know, we, we keep ourselves as a church, you know, when I say the church, I'm talking about the church. In other words, we can, we can keep ourselves so busy with each other's drama that we forget why we're here. That we forget that we're, each one of us is being transformed. While the, war, you know, the real enemy is not your brother, your sister, flesh and blood. The real enemy is the devil. The real enemy is the spirit of this age. The one who's trying to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's the real enemy. But we make it all about flesh and blood. In fact, the word even tells us we no longer, you know, we always use this scripture when we talk about spiritual warfare. We say we no longer wrestle with flesh and blood, but with principalities, powers of the air, principalities, all of these things. But do you realize that that scripture is also talking about you and your old self? We no longer wrestle with flesh and blood. Whose flesh? My old flesh. My old man. The one that's supposed to be dead. The one that's no longer living. The one who no longer has an opinion. The one who no longer has a say. The one who no longer has a voice at the table. The only thing we're wrestling with are, is the enemy himself trying to lie to us to steal, to kill, destroy, discourage. And guess what? Greater is he now that's in us than he that's in the world. We don't have to, we don't have to give room. We can say, talk to the hand. Move on. You're talking to the wrong person. You've come too late. I am deaf to what you have to say right now. All I'm listening to are what God says about me. And he says I'm being transformed. So we no longer have the right to be conformed to the image of the world. We do have a right to be transformed into the image of Christ. Amen. Transformed. How, do we, how does it happen? It's by the renewing of the mind. We offer ourselves up. We say, God, here's my heart, my mind, my body, my soul, my spirit. Here's everything about me. I offer it to you. But yet we know that the battlefield goes on in the mind. Our hearts have been changed. We're experiencing newness of life. And yet there's a battle going on. Am I going to listen to that dead man, dead woman? Am I going to listen to the lies of the enemy? Or am I going to listen to the word of God? This is your goal in life. That you don't want to believe anything about yourself that God has not said about you. It's a lie. When you get up in the morning to put your makeup on or to shave your beard or brush your teeth or whatever, those thoughts that cross your mind, they better be just God's thoughts. And if you, and if you start hearing other voices, <clears throat> you can say to that voice, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I no longer have to listen to you. You're no longer, you're, you're part of my past and my past has been forgiven and forgotten. And, and I don't have to listen to those voices in my head any longer, in my heart, but rather listen. And how do we hear God's voice? 
You know, we talk, if you've been here with us for very long, you've heard us talk about how much we need to be in the word and not just in the word, but taking time daily. We talk about this SOAP method. If you've been through growth track, what the first step you'll, step one in growth track, first Sunday of the month, we're going to talk about SOAP. You know, in other words, you may say, well, pastor, you know, when it comes to hearing God, I, I don't hear God's voice. I want to know his will, but I'm not, I don't hear him. Well, this is the deal. If you don't hear him, you can read him. And you, if you continue reading him, then you will, he will read you. You'll open up the word, S for scripture. You open up a word, just read a chapter. And if something just pops off the page, and you may not even know what it all means, but all you know is somehow it's grabbed your attention. What is it? That is God speaking to you. That is a transforming moment happening in your life. You might not be able to comprehend it. You might not be able to understand it in the moment, but just let God transform you. Let God do a work. Most of the work he does is behind the scenes. If he were to tell you everything he was going to do right up front, you'd run out of this building screaming, and you'd say, I'm never going back to zeal again because I cannot imagine that God would do that with me. Amen? But most of the work he does is behind the scenes. It's in the heart. And by the time we comprehend it, by the time we realize it, transformation has taken place. A renewed mind is taking place. And so we say soap, S for scripture, O for observation. What's going on? What's God saying? Every time I open up my little notebook and begin to write down an observation, it's the most inspired time of the day for me. I begin writing down things and all of a sudden God gives me more stuff. And I just keep writing and writing. And then there's the application. God, what, what has your word revealed today that is a lie? What has your re word revealed today that is wrong thinking? What, what opinion of you have I had that is incorrect? And what am I going to do to change it today? God, I take your word. And then the P is for prayer because we can't make it happen. All we can say is, Lord, I recognize it. Now, God, work it out in me. And that's why we need to go to God in prayer. To say, God, help me. Give me the grace. Give me the will and the desire to do your good pleasure. And so let me say it this way. You are worth the time spent in the renewing of your mind. Tell your neighbor, you are worth the time spent in the renewing of your mind. How do you do that? You get in God's presence. You get in God's word. You let the washing of the word take place in your life. You can't just drive to work and count it as your, you know, God time. The meat and potatoes is when you're in the closet, per se, or at your kitchen table, or, or maybe, maybe at the break, you, instead of going and eating with all the coworkers, you go to your car or wherever. You need to find a place where you can speak to God and God can speak to you. Amen? Drive time is just the icing on the cake. It should be the overflow. But you need to get some word in you. You need to get what does God say about you. Because it is that that the Holy Spirit will remind you when those temptations come up. He'll remind you. There's times I remember over, over my lifetime that, that a crisis would come up and almost immediately God would, I, out of nowhere, this scripture, I may not know the address to it, but all I know, but I know it's the word. All of a sudden God will remind me, the Holy Spirit will remind me what God says about this. And that becomes the word I stand on. Faith comes by hearing, not just anything, but hearing God's word. Amen? And so if you want your mind transformed, if you're tired of living in the gutter, if you're tired of living in bondage, tired of living sleepless nights in fear, intimidations, lies of the enemy. I woke up just a couple nights ago, and uh, it was just a, a night of nightmares. I don't even remember what I was dreaming. But I woke up, and I realized that I was, I was, there was the enemy himself was confronting me. And in that, I have the word of God. And I say, greater is he that's in me than you, devil. And I began to, in that moment, I began to say, enemy, you have no right here. My word, God's word says, you have no right in my house. You have no right in my bedroom. You have no right in my heart, in mine, or in, even in my dreams. 
and I began to take authority. I said, you need to go in Jesus' name. And every time that happens, I can feel a shift in the room. I can feel a change in the atmosphere. Why? Because the enemy has to obey God's word. Amen? He may not obey your word, but he has to obey God's word. He may not obey your, what you think, but he certainly has to come under the authority of Jesus. Amen? And when a man of God and a woman of God who's being transformed into the image of Jesus, all that devil sees is Jesus. Amen? We ought to give the devil a headache every time we walk through the city of Hermiston. Walmart, Safeway, the bank, the gas station, your workplace. When you walk on, demons should start scattering because they say, oh my goodness. They don't say, here comes Daniel. They say, here comes Jesus. They don't say, here comes Amanda. They say, here comes Jesus. We cannot abide in that same place. We cannot, we, we, we are not comfortable as long as there is a spirit-filled, God-believing, Jesus, resurrected, resurrected power, saint in the house. Amen? You are worth the time spent in the renewing of your mind. It is not a wasted, it's not a wasted time. But it is, and, and, so, and, and then to do that, we're able to discern what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us. The world's conformity starts on the outside and, and it just tries to press us it brings death, disparaging, uh, hopelessness, discouragement. But God's transformation, starting on the inside, it brings life. And so we as believers, we have been made, we were once dead in sin, but we have been made alive in Christ. That's the amazing part, the amazing miracle about salvation. He makes dead people live. The old man is dead, yes, Good riddance. We already gave him a funeral the day you said yes, but now we are alive in Christ. And now that we're alive in Christ and you're saying, God, what is your will for my life? Number one, to be like Jesus. That's the first step. Secondly, for your, we are to find our function. Tell your neighbor, find your function. Find your function. This is for everybody. This is not just for the, for the super saints here. This is, I don't care if you've been born again for one hour or you've been born again for 50 years. This is for every one of us. Find your function. Paul goes on to say in this chapter, for I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, do not think more highly of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. Verse 5 of chapter 12. So, <clears throat> so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Prophecy, faith, uh, ministry, teaching, uh, exhortation, uh, uh, giving, uh, leading or administration, mercy done in cheerfulness. I skipped down through there just to list them. But as we meditate on this portion here, we have as believers the responsibility to find out what God's purpose is for our life. It's our responsibility. It's not your neighbor's responsibility to figure it out. It's your responsibility that's the one thing about mature believers is that we take personal responsibility. We take personal responsibility over the transformation of our minds because you're not going to have someone standing there with you 24-7 saying, don't do it. Don't go there. Don't say that. Don't think that. It is up to we as individuals to say, God, I take responsibility for myself. And in that, we're to take responsibility for discovering what is God's plan. And Paul basically is saying here that we approach God in humility. I'm not, there, there's all kinds of images of what humility looks like. False humility push, pushes people down. 
We're not talking about a humility that you just go out in the backyard and eat worms and have a pity party. That's not the kind of humility we're talking about. It's just saying, oh God, I'm worth nothing. I'm no good to nobody. That is, that is what the high, that's what the Pharisees did back in their day. They'd paint their eyes black when they were fasting and say, woe is me. Look at all my suffering. That is not the kind of humility God's looking for. False humility puts one down. Pride elevates one over another. But in God, it's when we recognize that we cannot fulfill his purpose for our life without him. It's when we realize we cannot do it without his will, his desire. It's called the grace of God. I remember back when I was in college, and I know I make references, but some of these were just key building blocks in my own walk with God. I was a freshman, 19 years old. I think it was like the spring of the year. I remember it was warm out. We're talking Louisiana, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And, uh, but I remember the night before, <clears throat> I, had, we, I was involved, I went, did outreach ministry as a student my first year, and, and that particular ministry was church visitation, meaning people would come to our church, and then we would pay, repay them a visit, saying, hey, th- thank you for coming. Is there anything we can pray with you about, anything we can do for you? And I remember there took place a conversation uh, at that house with some other students and the ones we were visiting that rocked my world, that basically was confirming and affirming things that God had spoken to me about me. And I remember, and they didn't know it, it was just casual conversation, but it was uplifting. And I remember that it was just a confirmation of what things I had seen and heard in my own time with God. And, and I remember going back, and, on, and in those days, college students, we would have a, on Thursday nights, have a 10 o'clock prayer meeting. How many love starting prayer meeting at 10 o'clock p.m.? Yeah, I can tell what age group, age group we're playing to here today. For most of us, that's our bedtime, right? The things that we aspire to in our youth, now we say, no, I'm going to put myself to bed uh, at that time. But at 10 o'clock at night, we'd have 50 or, or 70 guys on, it was, it was the seventh floor of, that can, of, the, of the men's side in the dormitory. And I remember going into that prayer meeting it had already started. We had come in late, and I was out in the hallway, and I just rolled over on the floor, and my mind was just being overwhelmed by, the, by not only the word God had given me, but also by the confirmations that were spoken indirectly to me that night regarding what I could anticipate in, fu- in my future. Because how many of you know that God knows the end from the beginning? He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. That's what we're talking about today. What is God's will for my life? Does God have a plan for my life? Yes, he does. And so I remember that night, I was on my face, and I was doing what what we as Christians should aspire to all of our lives, and that is what we call sucking carpet. How many have ever sucked carpet? Okay. Well, we need to increase the ratio of carpet suckers at Zeal Church because sucking carpet is when you come to a place, and it doesn't happen just once. It should happen throughout your walk with God. It comes to a place where you say, God, I do not know how to do this myself. I cannot do this myself. I need your help. I know this is what you've said about me, but I cannot imagine it for myself. I know this is what you've planned for me, but I don't even know where to start. And you find yourself on the floor, on the carpet, just snotting it up, soaking it with tears, sometimes even just groaning with groanings that cannot be uttered, saying, God, my ambition is to know your will and to do it. Amen? And it's not just for, like I say, the super saints. It's for everybody, every individual needs to say, God, and and so that's what Paul was saying here. He was approaching God in this way. He was saying, don't think more highly of yourselves than you should think, but rather come to God with, we should be thinking soberly. It means to have a proper viewpoint of ourselves in the eyes of God. And so what is that viewpoint? God, you've created me. You made me. I cannot do this on my own. It is you in me. It's you through me. What do I do next? I remember hearing Billy Graham say this one time 
Because, you, you know, you have him. He passed away a few years ago. I think it was like 99. He really was 100, really. But they would ask him, How, what would you say is the key to your success? You've become one of the most integrous, uh, far-reaching uh, evangelists of our past century. And he would say, what is the key? What did you do right? And he would simply say these words. He would say, I simply listened to God and did it. I just waited for God's voice or his nudging or in the word, and I did it. That is what we call dependency on God. That's what we call relying on God. That's what you call humility. It's Moses. He wrote the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In the book of, in the book of Exodus, Moses wrote these words, and Moses was the most humble man in all the earth. It's like Cassie saying, Terry, Pastor Terry, I'm the most humble people, I'm the most humble person at zeal. It's like she's about to write it, come out with a book, 10 Ways I Became Humble, you know, and how I achieved it. But no, humility is this. That's why we, don't, we have a wrong understanding of what humility is. Humility is taking God at his word and doing it. We make it so complicated we let the enemy speak into us and say, oh, no, that's not God. Oh, no, you can't do that. You better not. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to call you a fool. They're going to think you're an idiot. They're gonna, they might even resist you. They might even come against you. They might scratch your car with their keys. They might, you know, spit in your food, you know, during lunch hour, put a nice one in your bag just because they cannot seem to get along with you. But true humility is this. It's simply taking God at his word and doing it. Amen? And so God says here, we need to find our function. We need to find our function. We need to come to him with humility. Get this, though. Verse 3, God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. God never calls a person to fulfill a function in his work without promising to give you the faith needed to carry it out. If God has, if you're, if you're experiencing that transforming process going on with Jesus and God is saying, Terry or whoever you may be, this is what I've called you to, this is what I've made you for, he will give you the faith to fulfill it. He won't give you the faith to fulfill someone else's calling. He'll give you the faith to fulfill your own calling. You're going to do things that I'm never going to do. And I'm going to do things you're never going to do. And God's going to give you the faith to accomplish it because that's what he's made you for. That's what he's called you to in, this, in his kingdom. But yet he's not going to tell me, Terry, to fulfill Tony's calling I won't have the faith to fulfill the call of God on her or Brian or whoever you may be. God will give me faith to fulfill my calling. And your calling, the faith it takes to fulfill your calling might look crazy sometimes. People will come to you because they don't have that faith for that situation like you have it. And they'll say, you are crazy. You, are, you need to stop right now. Uh, this can't, you can't possibly do this. But every time you go back to the prayer closet, every time you consult with the Lord, the Holy Spirit keeps saying, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. This is what God made you for. This is what he created you for. He's going to put his glory on display in your life in this area. Amen? We need men of God, women of God, who will take God at his word, and not just that, but to trust that he will give you the faith to carry it out. Oftentimes it looks crazy until it happens. But it takes faith to get there. Failure to rely on God for his faith or grace will prevent us from fulfilling his call on our life. 
Verse four, you, have, you are many members in the one body, but all members do not have the same function. So this is where the rubber meets the road. God is all about unity. He's all about oneness. Think about this. He's not about conformity. Yes, we're being transformed and conformed into the image of Jesus, but when it comes to unity, unity should not be mistaken as conformity. In other words, it's not that we just all dress alike, cut our hair alike, go to the same restaurants, uh, wear the same shoes, you know, but yet it is in diversity that we find the truest form, form of, of unity. Because one is not better than the other. One ministry is not better than the other. One person is not better than the other. He is, the Bible says, he is no respecter of persons. He loves us the same. And the giftings and callings that he puts on each one of our lives, though some may be more visible than others, they are no greater than others. Because it takes all of us. Ephesians 4 talks about how that we being the body, that each of us, that every joint supplies something to the body. Was it talking about, what kind of a joint was it talking about? An actual physical joint. Do you realize the marrow of the bone is what provides the white blood cells to fight off infection and other things? And so that joint, every joint supplies. In other words, when you are not being transformed in the likeness of Jesus, when it's like dead men talking to dead men, back to Romans 4, drama, 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 and you're not even seeing what God's plan is for your life because you can't, but rather when you're in a place where you're saying, God, I'm, I'm, I'm going after you. I only want to believe what you have to say about me. And then he shows you his will, shows you his desire, and realize this is that it may look different than anybody else's. Yes, there are multiple people doing similar things, but no one is going to accomplish it in the faith that you accomplish it. No one's going to do it in the manner in which God has created you and called you to do. And so different functions, while there may be various functions in the body, all contribute to the unity of the church, unity of the body of Christ. Psalms 133 says it this way. It says, unity is like the oil that's being poured out over Aaron's head and runs down his beard onto his clothing, down to the ground. And then it says, and because of the unity, the last verse in verse, it's one of the short chapters, 133, go look it up. It says, in that God releases life forevermore. The disciples were all in one place in one accord. There was unity, not conformity, but unity. They were all going for the same thing, recognizing God's purpose in their life. And what did the words say? Holy Spirit came and filled them up. It's when we, the body, because as a growing church of zeal, we are little C, among the big C's, the church world at large, but as we continue to grow as a zeal family, a family of God, there is no lacking of work to do. You can't say, well, someone else has got it covered. No, there is a ministry that God has created you for and by doing it, you are adding not only to the ministries of the Zeal family, but to the unity of Zeal family. You're adding to, the, to what God's wanting to accomplish in the earth. Do you think when we get to heaven, it's just going to be the few doing the much, and the rest of us are sitting around on clouds, eating grapes and wearing those plastic diapers, you know, <laughs> for the older people? No, Every, heaven is industrious. Every one of us are going to be given a ministry. But we don't have to wait to get to heaven to enjoy being used by God in ministry. In other words, he wants us to do something now with it. We don't just sit back and wait on the Lord until he comes again, but rather we're saying, God, put me in a place, use me, in ministry. So we being many, so zeal being many, zeal family being many, are one body and individually members of one another. 
And so that is the second step. Let me say it this way as a final word on that subject. It is a, you'll love this one, so brace yourself. Get ready to shout. It is completely contradictory to say I'm a believer, but I have no ministry. <laughs> Buckle up for that one. It is a contradiction to say I love Jesus, but I have no ministry. I have no purpose. I have no gifting, no calling, no faith to say, God, you call me this, but I don't, I don't, I don't see it. No, God has given us each a ministry. What does it look like? It looks like the gift of prophecy. It looks like fulfilling maybe functions and all. And I'm reading the latter part of this chapter, just highlighting prophecy. In other words, God will give you a download and you'll speak a word of encouragement to a people, to an individual. You know, back we've been going through Ezra. I, mean, I hate, I'm trying not to add more time to this message today, but in, in our 7 a.m. Zoom calls, of which if you're not part of it, please come join us. We're in the book of Ezra. And in, in Ezra chapters 4, 5, and 6, the children of Israel, the first wave, 50,000 were coming back from captivity from Babylon. And the Bible says that in the first, in the, in the, you know, they've been there for a little bit. Then they start offering sacrifices. And then they began to lay the foundation of the temple. Ezra's, Ezra helped in the rebuilding of the temple. Nehemiah would come in the rebuilding of the wall around the temple. But in the meantime, they start offering sacrifices. And the word says that, that when they finish laying the foundation stones of the foundation, that the young men shouted for joy and the old men cried. Old men that had been there before when they saw the destruction of it had outlived the 70 years of bondage and are now back, <clears throat> excuse me, back again to where the sound of it, they could not distinguish the laughing from the crying. And the word says that the noise was heard afar off. How many of you know when the church is being transformed, and when the church is discovering who she is in Christ, it will be heard afar off. It will send shock waves through the gates of hell. And then what happened was, then they began to build, they began to, to build the walls of the temple. And the word says that in so doing, that the people all around, the non-Jewish people, came to him and says, hey, can we help you? And Ezra and the priest, I think his name was Jedediah, something like that, a lot of Jeds in the Old Testament, but they said, no, thank you, no thank you, we're going to do it ourselves. Because these people said, well, we serve Jehovah too. You know, you don't see there, you've got to read between the lines, they serve Jehovah and a number of other gods. Isn't that like the devil? In other words, that he, you know, you're doing, you, you're being transformed. You're starting to build a foundation of faith in your life. You're seeing the walls going up. You're seeing the structure going up. And then the enemy comes along and says, hey, why don't you just, don't be so radical. Just kind of let us help. You know, compromise. Let us help. And you have to understand the difference between God's ways versus the enemy's ways. And the word says that, Ezra said, no, thank you, no thank you. We're going to do it ourselves. And so as a result, the people then said, then the people, the word says, began harassing them. If you're not going to let us help you, then we're going to keep you from doing it. And they started harassing them. And to the point where the word says that they even threatened them, if you don't stop building this building, we're going to, we're going to tell on you. We're going to send a letter to the king of Babylon the one that's king now, not the one that sent you, but the one that's king now, we're going to tell on you and he will stop you. And the sad part is, is that the Israelites of that day, were, they felt fear and intimidation and they put down the hammer and they stopped the work of the Lord. And by the time that letter got to the, got to the ruler of Babylon and back, it was probably about a year to two years. So there's two years wasted right there where they didn't do anything. And then 
once the letter came back, that king said, no, you got to stop. Because he was not aware of what King Cyrus had said. And then what happened was the building got delayed yet for another 15 years. And so for 18 to 20 years, the people of God did not work on the house of God. How many times in your walk with God, the enemy comes in and tries to stifle you and you put the hammer down. There are countless people that I know that were once feverishly just going after God and saying, Lord, put me in. I want to give me a project. Give me something to do. And somewhere along the line, someone came and lied to them, intimidated them, wanted them to compromise, put fear in their heart, and they just put the hammer down. And for 18 to 20 years, God's work was delayed. But then, I think it's chapter 5, two men, Zechariah and Haggai, prophets of God, stood up and they began to prophesy, thus says the Lord. The work you've begun, you, you need to complete it. This is God's work. And the Bible says, because of it, the people of God picked up the hammer again and began to construct God's house. We need people to prophesy. We need people in ministry. We need people to teach, to be exhorters, to be givers, to be administrators, to show mercy. God gives gifts, and he gives faith to, to match those gifts. He gives faith to accomplish what he's made you for. The doing comes out of our being. The same Holy Spirit that is transforming you into the image of Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that is giving you the hammer and the nail, is giving you the ability to prophesy, to give words of knowledge, to lay hands on the sick, to teach, to administrate, to give, to help, to show mercy. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just a snippet. But everyone has a function in the body of Christ. And he says, the way I want you to do it is this. I want you to fulfill it and I want your, in holiness. In other words, love is your motivation. Do it with diligence. Do it with all joy. Do it with all patience. Uh, you're going you're gonna, to, like Paul, he gave us his story talking about patience. He said, you know, Five times I received stripes minus, 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was <clears throat> beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day, I a night and a day I've been in the deep. Uh, journeys, waters, robbers, countrymen, Gentiles, cities, wilderness, seas, false brethren, weariness, toiling, Sleepless nights, hunger, thirsting, fastings, cold, nakedness, and so many more things. But we see that in the doing of it, Paul endured these experiences because of the ministry which God had called him to. God gave him the faith, gave him the grace to do it. He said one quality is this, prayer. Steadfast prayer, communion with God even seasons of prayer, even days and nights of sucking carpet is what it's going to take for you to not just discover God's will, but to do it. And so he says with it, bless those who persecute you. Bless and not curse. In other words, speak well of that person. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. In other words, you're going to be able to enter into the feelings of other people he says, uh, repay no evil for evil, but have, regard for, but have regard for the good things in the sight of men. If it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably among men. There are some people that just do not want to be at peace with you. But as far as you're concerned, you're going to live in peace. Amen? You, you can't prevent them from doing it, but you can forgive them. Verse 19, beloved, don't avenge yourselves, but rather give place for God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay it, says the Lord. Therefore, if you have an enemy that's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. And then verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, 
when opposition comes, when, when, when intimidations come, when fears come, drowned it with good. Drowned whatever opposition, whatever evil, whatever temptation, just drowned it with the word of God. Amen? What's the will of God? That you, be, that you look like Jesus, love like Jesus, talk like Jesus. What's the will of God? That you discover your purpose, your function. What's the will of God? That you do it in holiness. Do it in love. Do it in patience, mercy, long-suffering. You know, it's not just about getting to heaven. It's about how you get there. You can't, you can't say the ends justifies the means. You know, we can't just sit back and say, okay, God, I'm just going to wait on you and just keep it to myself. But rather he says, I didn't save you just for you alone. I saved you that you may lead others to Christ. You're now, the Bible calls us trophies of grace. We're like a trophy. We're not just a plastic trophy sitting on a shelf, but rather every, every one of us, every one of us, we could take days get passing the microphone around, but every one of us God has redeemed out of darkness. And now every one of us, God says, now that you have been redeemed, you're my trophy, you're my treasure I want you to partner with me, and I want you to go find someone else. I want you to go heal someone else. I want you to go witness to someone else. I want you to go lead someone else out of the darkness that you just came out of. Amen? Isn't God so good? Can you stand with me this morning? There's so much more in this, in his word. But we're all going to take God's word and meditate on it. Amen? Amen? If you're here this morning and, you're saying, and you don't know Jesus, you're asking, what is God's will for my life? To you, God's will is this, accept his only son. That's God's will. That's the first and foremost step that you, and the most important decision you'll ever make is to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, if we believe in our heart in the Lord Jesus and confess with our mouth that God raised him from the dead, in other words, that Jesus is God's only sacrifice, and that we declare Jesus is Lord and that he is the resurrected Savior, we shall be saved. It's not just those words, but it's, it's putting our faith and trust in, in his sacrifice. He took our place. Have you ever had to suffer the, 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 the uh, I should say it, have you ever had to suffer the consequences of someone else's decision? Jesus did just that when he took upon himself all the world, our mistakes, our sin, and yet because he loved us so much, even while we were still sinners, he came and died and rose again. He was taking the risk that either we would accept him or reject him. And so he took the risk to save us. And if you're here today and you're saying, Pastor, I want to accept Jesus in my heart today. Would you, we'd love to party and we're going to celebrate with you. Would you lift up a bold hand and say, yes, that's me. That you want to accept Jesus in your heart. Anyone here this morning? Praise God. Anyone in the house today? So would you do this with me? We're going to pray this prayer. We're going to pray it together. This is a prayer that you can pray with anybody, anywhere. And it's not just what I say, but it's just praying God's word. But pray these words with me. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending your only son. We repeat back to you 
what you say about us. Lord, we are sinners. We need a Savior. I declare Jesus as my Savior. I declare him as Lord. I declare him as resurrected Savior. I turn away from my will, my ways, my sin to accept Jesus. Live in my heart. Be Lord in my life. You're my first resort, not my last. I give you my whole body as a living sacrifice that I may determine your will from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give God praise? <clears throat> if you prayed that prayer, we should have a QR code up here that you can come. And then we also have Bibles we want to give you. I'm going to ask the prayer team if they'll come. I've asked the worship team to sing one of the songs they sung in the worship set this morning in closing. But before they do, and as the prayer team comes to pray over, to pray if you're sick in body, if there's something you're going through and you just need someone to agree with you in prayer, that's what they're here for. We've seen so many miracles take place in prayer. Amen. And let me say it this way. For these who are serving this function, God has given them the faith to heal, the faith to encourage, to exhort. It doesn't just happen here. It happens all throughout this audience. But trust that when you step out as a believer and you're saying, God, what is my function? He's going to give you the faith to do that. Amen. And so we honor the faith of those who are saying, God, I, here I am. Use me. Amen. I want you to do this. I want you to put your hand over your heart, kind of as an act of faith, a declaration. There's a lot to think about today. This chapter has a lot in it. You know, your first step to knowing God's will is, God, I want to I wanna, I wanna gaze into the face of Jesus every day. I want to open up your word. I want to see Jesus, and I want Jesus to see me. Secondly, Lord, I want to know what is my function every day. And thirdly, God, give me, produce in me the will and the desire, as well as the the fruit, the love of God, all that it takes to meet the need and to, and to see others redeemed. Amen. This is, this is our prayer every day. And so, Lord, I just pray over every individual here in this house, dear God, that, Lord, that as, we go, as we're continuing to move forward in 2021, as we're coming into focus for what you have for each one of us in our walk with you, in our ministries, even the way we go about it, God, I pray, Lord, that you would bring transformation. God, that, that we would not look the same after this year. That this body of Christ, dear God, this zeal family, that as we continue to grow, so do the ministries of this church. With every person, there's new opportunities. For every individual that says yes to you, dear God, there are new opportunities to reach people in our city. And so, God, by saying yes to you as Savior, we have said yes to you as Lord, Lord of the harvest. God, highlight to us what is our function. God, give us the faith to accomplish it, the will and the desire to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. This is our prayer today, Lord. We're not satisfied. We can't call ourselves Christian and not have a purpose to walk in or a purpose to fulfill in your kingdom. But you are faithful to do it. The work you've begun, you're faithful to do it. The ministries you've called us to, you're faithful to give us the faith and the wherewithal, dear God, to accomplish it by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says amen and amen. Is that your prayer today? Is that your heart's cry today? Amen. These altars are open. If you want to sing in this closing song with us, it's a declaration of he is, that he is Lord.
But I want us just to, this is a momentous occasion to say, God, I'm all in. I am that living sacrifice on the altar of prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.